So textual analysis obviously is becoming increasingly popular in various fields of economics. Um, I think we've kind of seen already that most successful applications, and I'll show you a few more examples of that, uh, use text to measure economic concepts that are otherwise hard or impossible to measure. Um, and one theme I really want to emphasize is that so far, the simplest applications have been the most successful. So we had a bunch of questions about this, like why don't you use like a state-of-the-art AI and so forth. I think that a lot of those methods are kind of not really suited for the questions that we tend to ask, although um, you know, I do, do think it's important to keep an open mind. But so far, uh, I think most of what we're talking about is new data sources as opposed to like complicated new methods. And that's really what I want to emphasize here. So that's also why we structured these module, modules, newspapers, firm disclosures, patents. So we, we structured the models by uh, the, the modules by data source and not by method. Maybe in maybe in five years time, that's going to be completely different. Um, the other thing I want to kind of flag is that even if you figured out like a really cool AI thing, economists are generally uncomfortable with black box algorithms. And that comes from your first year econometrics course when we teach reverse causality. So I think people generally kind of don't like kitchen sink stuff. And AI kind of by its very nature is a kitchen sink sort of approach. So I think that's why economists tend to be uncomfortable with it. All right, so my advice, keep it simple, stay close to the text, read a lot. Uh, so this is something uh, that I've really learned is that you know when you get a puzzling result, it's very important to have your Python script read, like written up in a way that you can go and look at the underlying text and see what's going on because you can just see what like you can just read it. Um, okay. So, um, all right. So what I'm going to show you now is firm is using firm level text to generate firm level variables that are otherwise hard or impossible to measure. So I'm not going to try. I'm not going to, going to, going to um, yeah, so, so I want to introduce you essentially to a second CompuStat that's sitting next to the real CompuStat, which is firm the text that firms produce, which is just another kind of way for us to learn what's going on in firms. And firms obviously are important parts of the economy. Um, all right, so um, a lot of what I'll show you is all on English language earnings call transcripts. Uh, they cover listed firms in 80 plus countries. That's kind of important. So we just had a question about how do you deal with Japanese? Well, I'm going to show you a bunch of stuff where you kind of don't need to deal with Japanese. You just kind of look at the Japanese firms who's, who hold conference calls in English or whose conference calls have been translated into English. So that's kind of a, you know, a, a comfortable way of avoiding the problem of figuring out what to do with a different language. Uh, you can get those uh, from uh, Refinitive Icon, S&P, Seeking Alpha, more and more data outlets have these, these conference calls. Other firm disclosures are 10Ks that you can get, get from Edgar. I'll talk about that briefly if I have time. So um, the big data source that we found kind of very kind of useful across a number of different um, projects are earnings conference calls. So these are transcripts of something like, there's about like 300,000 available um, that that are called, held by the executives, investors, and analysts of about 11,000 or almost 12,000 firms. Um, and that data source kind of starts in 2002. The, 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 the way these earnings calls come into being is essentially uh, as part of disclosure requirements. So firms announce their earnings. That's just numbers that they release to the world. And then uh, you know, typically a couple of days later, uh, the firm's management jumps on the phone with investors and answers questions. And that's what these earnings calls are. They're transcripts from, of, of these conversations. So let me kind of start with the first paper that was very heavily kind of inspired by uh, the Baker Bloom Davis uh, uh, EPU paper. So uh, what we wanted to know is how much of the conversation between the firm's management and its analysts uh, is focusing on political risks. And the idea here being to try and understand uh, so the interaction between the political system and the firm based on what firms are talking about. Um, the method here, and this method is gonna be reapplied across different papers. So I'm just gonna explain it once here. Um, uh, the method is to work with two word combinations because we now have access to the full underlying text. We can work with what's called n-grams, 
So there's kind of a literature in computational linguistics that kind of says, well, you probably can learn a little bit more from looking at two, two or many word combinations than just from looking at a single word. Um, and uh, the simplest kind of n-gram is a bigram, which means two words. Um, so the way that this works is, you know, let's take um, uh, a textbook uh, on American politics and let's take a financial accounting textbook. And this is kind of what I'm explaining here is a training library approach to picking words that you look for. So let's put all the two word combinations that are in the American politics textbook into uh, set P. And let's take all the two word combinations that are in the financial accounting textbook in set N. The idea here being when managers don't talk about politics, they usually are supposed to talk about their earnings and other accounting stuff. So then if we want to measure political risk at the firm quarter uh, level, so we want to look basically at how long are they talking about political risk in a given call, is we're going to count the number of occurrences of political biograms in conjunction with a synonym for risk or uncertainty, and then divide by the total number of biograms in the transcript. So let me kind of introduce some notation. What I want to measure is the political risk that as perceived by firm I in quarter T is, how do I get that? I'm going to go through the all bigrams that are indexed with little b. I'm going to look for them and I'm going to see if little b bigram is in my set P but not N, meaning it's in my set of political bigrams but not non-political bigrams. But I'm going to count that, so that's a dummy variable that's one, but I'm going to count only if the second dummy variable is also one, which is a dummy variable for all words within uh, for all biograms within 10 words of a synonym for risk or uncertainty, which has a position that I'm indexing here with R. So then you count all of those mentions of political biograms in conjunction with a synonym for risk or uncertainty and divide by the length of the transcript. The last thing here, this is a weight, which is basically uh, accounts for the fact that some two word combinations like the constitution might be more political than others. Um, and this is just a frequency weight. This is saying how frequent is the biogram, the constitution in the training library for political terms. And I'll expand on that a little bit later. This is part of a methodology that's called TF-IDF in the computational linguistics uh, literature. All right. Um, so now, once you operate on the full text, one thing that you can do is you can try and deal with some of the concerns that you guys have raised earlier in a different way, which is, uh, often when we talk about risks, we're talking about bad things happening. So uh, the second step here is to construct a measure of political sentiment in firm I and quarter T. And this is kind of looking at, are the people who talk about these political things in a good or a bad mood when they talk about it? So I'm gonna go through the same text and I'm gonna look around the same political but not non-political biograms with my same weights as before. But now, instead of having a dummy variable that's one, if the biogram is within 10 words uh, of a synonym for risk or uncertainty, I'm just going to go and look 10 words before and after for happy and sad words. And happy and sad words in that literature are called tone words. So if you say great, fantastic, those are positive tone words. If you say terrible, awful, those are negative tone words. So just count plus one every, every time you see a positive one, minus one every time you see a negative one, and that's kind of from this kind of library by Logren and McDonald. There's lots of libraries like that, but that, that's, this seems to be the standard one. Okay, so let me pause there. So uh, I have a question here. Um, I This question perhaps applies less to the U.S. and more to other countries, but I was wondering if you've noticed that when firms, or especially very big firms, are discussing their earnings or their strategies, Please, the politicians in some way, um, either. Oh, I, I'm not sure I heard this correctly. Are you? Uh, so, was the question whether they they know that they're being listened to, and so they want to appease the politicians, or not piss them off? Yes. Uh, uh, so I think that's a very. Receiving... Yeah. So, so it's it's kind of more broad than that. So, I think that the, the earnings calls in general are a little bit less guarded than other disclosures that the firm makes. Typically, lawyers write all the written disclosures that come out of a listed firm. This is people talking. So it has to be a little bit more ad hoc because they don't necessarily know who's going to ask a question and who's going to ask what. 
Um, that said, firms are well aware that there's going to be stock market reactions. So you're, you're wondering about like the goons standing outside of the firm headquarters. They're also worried about the stock, stock market and they're worried about armies of lawyers, which like Elon Musk is like famously like getting into trouble for saying like, you know, incorrect stuff on earnings calls. So um, yes, so they're definitely aware that they're being watched. I, I'm not sure about cross country variation in this. I think it'll become very clear that the kind of political risk that firms are worried about are not the kind of political risk that you're thinking of right now. And I'll talk about that more in a, in, in a second. So there's not kind of regime change kind of political risk. It's typically, you know, are we going to get permission to make our hard valve kind of political risk? Um, does that make sense? Yes, I was just, I think that answers most of it. I was just thinking if your licenses depend on a government's approval yes. or such, but don't want to talk explicitly about the government doing a bad job or being risky in some way. Yes, yes. I, I, I think that's uh, that's entirely possible. Yes. Uh, okay. That said, you know, at least in the U.S., if there's a material risk to your business and you don't disclose it after somebody asks, you get a big fine. Okay. Thank you. Didn't know that. All right. So, uh, so let me kind of pause here. So this is the method. That was already all the method that I just showed you. So I just, just flipping through this, like, are there any questions about the method? Because I'm going to have like an epsilon sort of, you know, kind of more complication in a minute, but like, that's pretty much it. So I just want to make sure you're, everybody's happy with this. The P risk and the P sentiment. Okay. So, and please uh, just jump in and ask questions. Like I'm, I'm not, you know, like I, I'm, I'm not always going to catch the hand up. I hope I'm, I'm going to try and do my best. Um, okay. So one thing that's kind of maybe becoming a little bit less important, but was very important as Nick kind of uh, uh, kind of attest when we first started this literature, uh, when we first started in this literature, was to like convince people that what people say or write is actually important. Okay. So you you kind of go to Minnesota and they say nothing that people say means anything. You just look at what people do. So um, so, so here's just kind of a few steps uh, in this particular paper that we took that, and, and the reason I want to go through it briefly is because it might give you ideas to like, you know, for other validations, it's just to see, you know, what kind of checks can you make to convince yourself that what you're, what you're measuring kind of makes some sense. So first is to see, you know, if, the, if, if you think that you're measuring political risk, then it should identify correctly conversations about risks associated with political topics. So. In other words, read the underlying text. Yeah. So one thing here is that you know what we found is that the biograms with the highest scores, the highest term frequencies, are intuitively linked to politics, like the Constitution, public opinion, interest groups, and so forth. And then you know just reading the highest scoring uh, transcripts and making sure that they're actually talking about political risk to see if there's anything going wrong. Um, all right. Let me kind of skip skip this. Um, the second, the second thing you want to look at is what you know uh, is whether uh, these measures of risk are associated with firm level outcomes that you think should also be associated with risk. Um, so let me show you this. So uh, we have a lot. So I guess we have a strong intuition that any kind of risk at the firm level should show up in higher stock market volatility. And you can see that like firms that have higher political risk indeed have higher stock market volatility even you know, uh, uh, conditional on firm or even CEO fixed effects. So even with like at, at times when the firm faces higher political risk, it also has higher stock market volatility. You can look at a bunch of other outcomes that traditionally have been associated with uh, risk. So uh, kind of delaying investment, for example, firms that have higher political risk delay investment. The second variable here is planned investment next year lower planned investment when risk is high. This is the, precisely the kind of channel that people have been writing about a lot. And you also hire fewer people. Again, that's, you know, when you hire people, uh, it's kind of hard to get rid of them again. So there's, so you can think of like investing and hiring people as sort of like an investment decision. Um, and then you kind of contrast that with like variation in sales and there you sue less. So, so basically what we know from economic theory is that measures of risk should be more associated with delaying uh, adjustments that uh, uh, that are costly to make. And this is exactly what you see in the data here. Um, because we were particularly looking at political risk, we also wanted to see whether firms uh, 
that face more political risk also donate more uh, to politicians. Uh, and what you see is that's, in that's exactly what's happening. So firms seem to manage political risk by donating more, by donating to more po politicians, and also by expanding their lobbying activities. And all of this is kind of a, you know, within firm. Uh, uh, so, so this is true within firm and within sector. Um, here's the, uh, I've already kind of mentioned, you want to kind of distinguish news about the mean from news about the variance. So what's important that your measure of risk is, remains associated with the firm level outcomes once you control for variation in the conditional mean. So if you can think of people saying, you know, talking a lot about risk, and at the same time, uh, um, you know, you throw in controls that control for the overall kind of like quality of the news. If you get bad news uh, or good, so, so what this here is saying is that if you get good news, you tend to invest more. If you get bad news about, pol about politics, you invest less. So that's what the second coefficient here means. Um, all right, do you have any questions about this so far? All right, so let me, uh, let me continue. So here's kind of a, a fun uh, kind of placebo experiment. And I think this is kind of like useful in a number of different contexts where if there's a concept that you're think, if you think that you're, you're measuring a specific concept where it's like specifically political risk in this case, you might want to contrast it with the same concept, uh, but you know, with a little twist. So for example, you might want to differentiate political risk from overall risk. We had some questions about that earlier. How do you, you know, so, so for example, if you think of the VIX as the measurement of overall risk, then EPO kind of like might be capturing the political part of that risk. So here's kind of a, a way of approaching that by simply going and counting how many times do they say risk overall and call that a measure of overall risk without conditioning on political anything. And similarly, Remember, I kind of isolated political, but not non-political biograms in the beginning, and then looked around these political, but not non-political biograms for synonyms for risk. Well, I can reverse that and look for non-political uh, uh, biograms and see how much risk is associated with these non-political biograms. Call that a measure of non-political risk. So now basic theory would say that, so we think that the firm, reduces its investment because of risk, regardless of whether it's political or non-political. So if what I'm doing here makes any sense, then what I would hope is that we get a negative association between political risk, but also non-political risk and investment. And that if I control for overall risk, that that's gonna drive out some of the variation that's picked up by political risk. And that's exactly what you see here. Similarly for employment, there's an independent negative effect of non-political risk on employment, even after controlling for political risk. Now, when you look at the political outcomes measured at the firm level, how much does the firm lobby and how much does it donate to politicians, those outcomes do not seem to be affected by non-political risk or by overall risk once I control for political risk. So this is a nice way of like kind of having a placebo uh, experiment to see if you can exactly get to the concept that you think that you that, that you that you're planning to get at. Okay. Um, let me okay, let me skip this about measurement error. Here's kind of a um, an example. So having constructed the measure of political risk at the firm level, I can now go and look at the most impactful pieces of text that generate each spike at the firm level. So here's, a, uh, here's an example from a coal burning power plant firm. Um, and I'm looking at its variation and its political risk over time. And you see what they're worried about in each of these spikes by looking at influential pieces of text. Now I'll actually expand on that approach a little bit later. So what you see here is that like the first spike here is them complaining about the, the possibility of climate legislation and also tightening of EPA rules about the emissions from coal burning power plants. Then there's another spike here about, you know, maybe the Senate is gonna do something about CO2 regulations. And then they're worried about mercury emissions and the way that EP, the EPA 
uh, regulates how much mercury emissions you can make across state, state borders. So I'm just showing you this because, you know, if, like what's kind of nice about underlying text is that when you see a spike, you can just go and look at what kind of conversations are generating that spike. In fact, what I tell all of my students is when you kind of, when you prepare your Python code, you want to make sure that you can always go to the underlying text and pull some of these influential snippets. Okay, are there any questions so far? All right, so then let me talk about another paper that's actually kind of unfinished. And uh, Jesse, who's also here, is one of the co-authors on that paper, so you can correct me for all the things that, uh, that I might be missing here. Um, so I'm kind of excited about this, uh, this paper, and so I, so I wanted to share it here with you. So um, this, is a, this is taking essentially the same TF-IDF method that I showed you before, and it actually kind of steals some of what Nick was saying before. So we're going to use, so, so, what, so what we're uh, after in this paper is measuring sources and transmission of country risk. So we wanted to use these firm level documents to measure how much risk does each individual firm associate with, with each other country in our data. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to build a training library of text that is uh, typical of, convert, of, of, basic, of people writing about a given country. So rather than kind of prescribing a bag of words here and just looking for the word Germany, for example, I'm, I'm going to use kind of these training libraries to figure out what are two word combinations that typically are used when people talk about a given country. These are the same country commerce, I think these are the same country commerce reports that they're uh, different. Nick mentioned yeah. earlier, sorry? So they're different. They're different, uh, okay. Uh, this is why we only have uh, uh, 56 countries because the country commerce reports are uh, targeted for investors going in. And so they do it for fewer countries than the, the country reports that, that Nick was talking about. Okay, so these are- hey, Jesse, I didn't, it's interesting, I wasn't aware of that. Are they more detailed? They're, yeah, they're, they're more detailed and they're written in a way that um, you want to think that they're really trying, they're written for people who are like going to try to do business in the country. And so instead of like um, necessarily um, going through like the current events, it would, it would be more like this is a bilateral tax rate between this country and, and here, these are the key agencies in the country. These are the people right. who are running the agency. This is the address of the agency. And so they tend to be a little bit closer to like a hundred or so pages, um, right. but the cost of that is um, lower country coverage. Got it. So these fifty-six countries are obviously the, the ones with the largest economies in the world. So we're missing a bunch of countries that probably are not going to show up all that much in firm-level conversation. Um, so now. Uh, so before we were trying to distinguish political from non-political text. Now we have a harder uh, task, which is distinguishing uh, text that is concerned with each of 56 different countries. So um, we're going to use, again, this TF-IDF methodology. What I didn't tell you before is that so this, this kind of term I showed you before is like the frequency of how often. So for example, if I look at the bigram Angela Merkel, it's going to be much, much more frequent in the German training library library than in the American training library, right? So the Germans are going to talk a lot more about Angela Merkel. So Angela Merkel is going to have a high term frequency for Germany, but there's a concern that some two word combinations that are very frequent in a given country might also be used a lot in conversations about other countries. So one example of this is like EU institutions, right? The so European Commission, if you say European Commission, then that's sort of a hint that, you know, you're talking about European country, but it could be any one of them. So you want a second term that penalizes for that. And that's, so what tip, pe people typically do, and this is literally out of the textbook, is you want to multiply the weight for each bigram with uh, what's called the inverse document frequency. The inverse document frequency is just the log of the number of training libraries you're trying to distinguish divided by the number of uh, libraries in which the bigram occurs. So if Angela Merkel, appears in all 56 training libraries that I'm looking at, it's going to be log of 56 divided by 56 is, is uh, log of one is zero. Yeah, so I'm downweighting 
digrams that are that are kind of ambiguous about uh, uh, in the sense that we could be talking about many different countries. And this, by the way, if anybody, if you ever wanted to unleash kind of more complicated machine learning, there's surely like ways of improving on this little part. Okay, so now uh, what we want to do is we want to construct for each quarter, for each firm in each quarter and each country. Um, so, sorry, for each firm in each quarter, we want to uh, measure how much time are they, are they spending talking about risk associated with that country. Yeah, so this is essentially the same formula I've showed you before. So I'm going to go through the text. I'm going to look for two word combinations. Aha, I found Angela Merkel. They're probably talking about Germany. Now I'm going to look around that. Are they also saying something about risk? If yes, I'm going to count one. Then you know, go further down the text. If they talk about the Bundesbank, that's also going to be biograms that have a high weight for Germany. Say something at risk again, count two, and so on. So what I get from that is a measure of country risk at the firm quarter country level. And now what we do in this paper is we leverage that by aggregating that firm country quarter level measure in four different dimensions. The first and the simplest one, which is kind of similar to the world uncertainty index that, that Nick was mentioning before, is we simply go across all firms. I'm going to look at the average number of time, the average amount of time they're spending talking about risk associated with a given country C. So I'm going to have country risk associated with country C at time T, and that's just going to be an index for each of the 56 countries. The second aggregation is looking at the total amount of foreign risk a given firm is facing. So I'm going to go to firm I, and I'm going to look at how much risk are they associating with foreign countries. I'm now summing across all C that are not my own country. Then, and maybe most, most excitingly, you can look at transmission of risk from a given origin to a given destination country, because I know for each of the, for each of the firms in my data set which, which, uh, um, which country their headquarters is in. So the transmission of risk from an origin country O to a destination country D is then simply taking the average across all my transcripts that I have from a given country. So let's say I'm going to look at how much risk are Dutch firms associating with the US at a given point in time. I'm going to go to those Dutch firms, and I'm going to average country risk firm Dutch firm I is associating with origin country US in that quarter. So this is now a bilateral measure of the transmission of risk. And then finally, if you sign up across both firms and countries, then you get a measure of global risk. So it's four different dimensions, and they're going to be useful for four different kinds of questions. Does that make sense? Awesome. All right. So in the same way that I just measure, that I just kind of, so, so you can think of this as like people sometimes call this dyadic data, right? So this is origin destination specific data. So in the same way that I just kind of uh, constructed a measure of country risk at the firm country quarter level, I can also uh, kind of construct a measure of country sentiment in the same way as think of that as like, there's some risk associated with the country and there's also good or bad news about the country as a whole. Um, and then also I'm gonna construct firm risk, which is just the unweighted count of risk words in transcript uh, of firm I in quarter T. I'm going to use that as a control. All right, that's all the math for now. Any questions? So let me show you an example. So remember step one was, I'm going to go and find all the words that are indicative of conversations of a given country. So I have like, here's the example for the highest scoring words for Turkey. That's Turkey, Turkish, and but interestingly, also specific Turkish institutions like the Gazette, which is like where they publish their uh, laws, the Turk ex Bank, Ankara Official Gazette, and GDFI. So these are ministries and kind of specific Turkish institutions that you're picking up with this approach. And that's coming from the country commerce report. All right. So maybe not surprisingly, you can show that stock returns of a given country at a given point in time are strongly associated with variation in these two measures. Variation in 
country risk and country sentiment. And here I'm measuring country risk and country sentiment simply by averaging across all firms of my sample. So I'm going to measure uh, Turkish country risk by taking all of my 11,000 firms and looking at how much time are people in that firm spending talking about risk associated with Turkish words. So higher country risk, lower stock returns, higher country sentiment, more positive news about the country, uh, higher stock returns. Uh, similarly, higher country risk, higher realized volatility, and thankfully there's no effect here of variation in the mean, and that sort of bolsters also our, our confidence that, that what we're doing here makes some sense. So let me show you an example of this, just a fixed idea. So this is the time series for Greek country risk as measured by the average across all firms in our sample, that's the gray. And you see here, there's kind of two global crises, the global financial crisis and the COVID pandemic. Um, Jesse, sorry, how long am I going for? You have 14 minutes left. Okay. Uh, and the COVID pandemic, but then there's kind of, kind of very specific kind of Greek stuff that's happening here, particularly the various ups and downs of the Greek sovereign debt crisis. Um, and what's kind of beautiful about this is that this time series is self-labeling. So you can program your Python code to go to the piece of text that is most responsible for this spike here. And it will say, concern related to the possible impact of a Greek Eurozone exit has led to persistent volatility. And you can do this for each of these spikes. So it's very easy to, to label these spikes. You don't have to guess or Google what happened at that time. Why? Because you have underlying text that you can go to. The second thing I want to show you is it's very kind of interesting here is that you can aggregate this across just financial firms. So the yellow is Greek country risk as perceived by only firms that are themselves financial firms. And you see that a lot of these spikes in the Greek sovereign debt crisis are driven by financial firms. And I'll have a lot more to say about that in, in, in four minutes, hopefully. Just compare this for a second to the Turkish country risk. You see here, there's much less action on the yellow firms. Okay, so much less kind of of the spike is driven by financial firms. Here's the time series of global risk. That's the average of all, of all the country risks. And I already mentioned, there's two crises. One uh, uh, is the global financial crisis. This year is the Eurozone debt crisis. And then there's the COVID pandemic. Those are the big spikes. Eric, this looks similar to our WI, I think. It's trending up. You know, I wondered that right. I worried that every, these measures of uncertainty are trending. I guess it's from the EIU as well. You do see, yeah. So the, actually, the trend couldn't come from the EIU because we never use risk words from EIU. So we, if there was a trend in how much the firms talk about it, that could do it. But I think risk never comes from EIU. So yeah, the, the, ca the count on risk alone should never be there because we just use EIU as a training library. So it means that basically risk is going up both. Yeah. So it's going That's up right. both sources of text. In our the, EI, the 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 EIU training libraries in our case here it's just one bin for the whole. There's no okay, distinction, got it. and that's time invariant. Exactly. So what this is saying yeah. is that the earnings conference calls have a time trend in the sense that there's more. Yeah, this is a slight trend. It's much less pronounced, I would say, than in the newspapers. But there is a time trend, and I think it's upwards, definitely. Yeah, I mean, we always wor worried about the EIU that it was trending up. I'm just trying to cross-check whether it's trending up over this time period as much because we have data going back further but yes I don't remember where not that much further how much it was trending up in comparison Jesse do you yeah, remember no, is is it... a significant positive time trend there, it looks like it right. yeah ours is not ours is okay it's pretty consistent ours is trending up but some of the trend is from the 90s appear lower than the 2000s so <laughs> if you take the 2000 2002 to 2018 it's very similar to what you have actually this is totally so separately talk offline, but I, I worried that somehow the world has become more focused than it. I mean, another story is the global financial crisis and COVID are generally an uncertainty shocks. And they're both, I mean, they're, if you look at re recessions, they're pretty terrible recessions. Post World War II, they're some of the worst recessions. So maybe it's not unreasonable right. that that's a period of uncertainty. But actually, what's interesting, so in addition to the, not, the, the time trend, because we use the time invariant EIU, that gray line, the mean of firm risk, is just counting how much firms say risk in their transcripts. So if we are getting the similar upward trend that, that you have, it would be from a completely unrelated data set. Because um, the, the pattern of the two, the blue and the gray are actually similar here. 
Yeah. So maybe risk is going up. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, two pandemics and Donald Trump, well, a pandemic, a global financial crisis, and Donald Trump are enough to kick this thing up. Matthew, you have a question. Yes. Uh, so my question relates to what Professor Bloom was just kind of talking about. So how do you disentangle whether, like, potentially this time trend is driven by an increase in attention versus an increase, like an attention to the phenomenon yeah. versus uh, so, the phenomenon itself? It depends really kind of on your research question. I'm not too worried about this because everything I'm going to show you is going to have country and firm fixed effect. Uh, sorry, it's going to have time and firm fixed effect. Uh, but for some research questions, this is more relevant than for others. Um, I, think, yeah. I think there is a, I mean, I am generally concerned with long, slow moving long run trends. Uh, and as Tarek says, I generally feel more comfortable doing stuff at business cycles. You're right that, you know, if you look back at newspapers back to the 80s, some stuff has changed. I mean, for example, the weather section has gone. Nobody gets the weather from the newspapers anymore. <laughs> I know this is earnings calls, but you know, there's other stuff in all text. Everything's changed with email, et cetera. So yeah, over the long haul, is why high frequency stuff, you know, within a few years is probably fine, business cycles. But yeah, I think it'd be slightly more problematic. No, it's not terrible, but it's a bit harder to argue. Like in our EPU, we see it trends quite clearly up from the 60s. That's a period of much greater political polarization. So one argument is the US is more unpredictable because the politics are more polarized, but it may just be newspapers focus more on it. So, Okay, so let me show you um, a few more pictures. So this is kind of what it looks like for Brazil, like you know, Lula getting elected and then like the, the big corruption crisis. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking for each, I'm looking at each uh, time series for each country. This is country risk all. So this is now taking the average across all firms in the world, how much they're talking about risk associated with Brazil. And I'm just putting dots for like two standard deviations abo above the mean. and telling you what the firms are talking about in those transcripts. Like here's another example, the Egyptian revolution, the Fukushima disaster in Japan. In Ireland, there's two crises. One is Brexit and the other one's also Brexit. Brexit vote, Brexit happening. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna use this definition of crises a little bit later on. Um, so I'm, I'm not gonna go through all of these. I already showed you Greece. Um, there's a, a variety of different things happening here. There's natural disasters, there's coups, there's economic crises, uh, there's trade wars. So in the US, we have the global financial crisis, we have the S&P downgrade uh, of US debt, uh, and we have uncertainty about fiscal policy around the fiscal cliff. Um, in China, you have like one of those here is like the Trump trade war, um, Spain, European debt crises, and so on. So it's a long list. Okay, so the first thing I want to show you is that, as you might have expected, and uh, you know, I guess this is kind of less surprising for people who haven't been in this literature, is that capital flows respond strongly to risk, and in particular, they respond strongly to country-specific risk. And this is kind of like a weird puzzle that existed in the literature, where like it was hard to find kind of country-specific variables that drive capital inflows. And it turns out that country risk is one of those. So country risk. Uh, strongly is associated with capital inflows. When you have more risk, there's less capital inflows, even when you control for global factors and in particular for you know time fixed effects. So people have written a lot about sort of waves and uh, uh, you know stuff that's happening in the center of the world economy, and then there's nothing that emerging markets can do about it, but they just get less capital flows now because there's more risk at the center. That is certainly going on, but country specific measures here also kind of do a lot of the work in explaining capital flows. Um, oops, sorry, okay. So uh, the next thing I wanna show you is uh, the association between, so it's kind of like another fun thing that you can do with this is you can measure a country's risk using only foreigners' perceptions. So this is what's called NHQ here. So here I'm averaging only the country risk perception of firms that are headquartered outside of the country that we're talking about. So I'm measuring Turkish risk with non-Turkish firms. And Tarek, five minutes. Yeah, okay, sorry. So, and the most important thing that you can see here is that you know, there's, there's differential explanatory power between uh, um, over and above uh, what firms in the country itself are, are thinking. All right. Uh, 
So let me kind of skip this and kind of show you um, the, the kind of interesting stuff about transmission risk. So remember, I can now average only across um, uh, kind of, for example, Turkish firms. So firms that are headquartered in Turkey, and we see how much risk they associate with each other foreign country. So there's a dyadic structure here for each point in time. I can look at how much do firms based in a given country associated with a given foreign other country. So this is kind of measuring the flow of risk across countries. By the way, Jesse, can I take like five minutes from this module and give it to the, from the, steal it from the next one? You, you control your two modules. Okay, I very good. Sure you, you take a break at some point. Okay, very good. So, so this is the trend, okay. So does this make sense? So the, the transmission risk from a given origin country to a given destination at a given point in time. And what you can imagine is that during normal times, I'm, I haven't shown you this, during normal times, this transmission of risk is very much about who are you close to, who do you usually trade with, and kind of who are your historical friends. Yeah, so you can look at that like in a table. Um, and what we were interested here in is how does transmission of risk differ during crises? So for each of our countries, I showed you these red dots in the time series, those are crisis periods. So for each of these crisis periods, we're gonna run a regression, which is the transmission of risk from a given country. So think about like the Turkish coup against Erdogan in, in, in Turkey. So for each destination country D at that point in time, I can run, uh, so I can, I can put those, stack those into a data set and run a regression of where is this Turkish risk going to um, relative to where does the risk usually flow? So this is the average transmission of risk from a given origin to, to a given destination in our sample. And we're relating that to the transmission of risk during, the cri during a crisis. And then, uh, so let me just show you a picture of that. So this here is the global, the green is the global financial crisis where I'm, so the green dots is how much risk do Austrian firms associated with the US during the global financial crisis? And you see, this is above the 45 degree line, so it means more than usual. Yeah, so that makes sense. And you can think of like the, pick the median country here and call that the global impact of the crisis. So the global impact of the crisis is kind of the middle of this cloud of dots. Now, the slope here, okay. Great, I'm gonna talk about a slope next. But so, so the point here is, if I now go to the crises with the highest global transmission, so where, where these, this cloud of dots here is the highest, that's going to be with the global financial crisis and COVID. And you see there's a slight difference here. If you, um, so the COVID crisis is coming from China. If you look here at risk associated with China by kind of firms in Singapore, Taiwan and Hong Kong during uh, the onset of the COVID crisis. So what you see here is there's much more of a, of a, uh, of, a sleep, uh, of a steep slope, the beta here is higher. Meaning that although this was like a very highly impactful crisis or is a very high, highly impactful crisis for all of the world, in the beginning, there was more transmission to places that usually interact more with China, like Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore. That's what this means here. Does that make sense? Let me show you some more examples of these pictures is that you can learn a lot about what these crises are doing and how they get transmitted. So here are two crises with the highest bilateral transmission. So bilateral transmission is gonna be the beta in this regression. The beta in this regression tells you how much of the risk transmission is going relatively speaking to the countries that usually import a lot of risk from that origin. So here are the floods in Thailand. And you see this, that cloud of dots here is very close to the 45 degree line. So people in Germany don't really care so much about the Thai crisis, but there's a high impact on firms in Singapore and Japan. So risk perceptions of Thailand and Singapore and Japan are off the scale, which means high beta here. These are typically places that interact a lot with Thailand. So we call this crisis with high bilateral transmission. Another example of this interesting is the Greek, the Greek sovereign debt crisis. The Greek sovereign debt crisis here, you can see lands disproportionately on European countries. We know why, because you know, there was a threat of a dissolution of the EMU. You see Austrian firms, Belgian firms, Spanish firms, German firms, Italian firms really worry about the Greek sovereign debt crisis, and the US is somewhere down here. Yeah, the US doesn't worry so much more about Greece than it usually does. All right, so 
we've already kind of seen two things. So the, so the strength of the global transmission is how high are the dots above the 45 degree line? The beta, the slope here is how, how much of the uh, transmission is bilateral. And then the third thing is the R squared of this regression. So here's an example of what we call a regular crisis where all the dots are very close to the regression line. So these are the Hong Kong protests. So the, the firms that worry about Hong Kong about the Hong Kong protests are firms that usually worry about Hong Kong, like firms in Singapore and Malaysia and in China. The exact opposite of that is irregular transmission. That's the Fukushima natural disaster, uh, the, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, where if you look at this cloud of points, it has a very low R squared. Why does it have a very low R squared? It's because the, the nuclear disaster had really weird impacts. It impacted supply chains, but it also, in Germany, for example, ended the use of nuclear power. And you can see conversations, this dot here is conversations of firms headquartered in Germany talking about risks coming from the Fukushima disaster. And the risk that they're talking about is, we're really worried Angela Merkel is gonna end nuclear power in Germany. And these are firms, by the way, we verified this, that have no trade links with Japan whatsoever. So what this is telling you is there, there are global crises that sometimes get transmitted in ways that are very different than the input output matrix would suggest. Okay. Hmm. Great. Okay. So, any questions about this, Thomas? I have a question. How do you know that the scale of, um, like, the risk assessment corresponds to the actual economic risk? Like, maybe ah. one country yes. is extremely worried, and they are very risk averse, and they talk a lot about it. But in terms of actual economic transmission, there's a, a limited amount compared to another country, who for some reason is. So, uh, okay, so there's, uh, okay, there's a simple answer and a complicated answer. The simple answer is, I want you to always keep in mind with this text-based stuff, where is the data coming from? So what this here is measuring is how much time are executives at global firms, these are big firms that have these conference calls, big listed firms, how much time are they spending talking about risks associated with a given country? That's it. That's what it is, not more and not less. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my first kind of response would be, you should think, well, these are probably commercial risks because the firms are talking about them, right? So political and other risks that maybe have nothing to do with firms, you should probably look for in different places. So, so think, first of all, commercial risks. The second more subtle thing is there could be cultural differences with how people use language. And then if you're worried about that, then you know what you can do is you can go and measure a country's risk using only, for example, US firms. And some of the stuff I've shown you, you can do with that, not this, but some of it you can do. The third, okay, good, that's it. <laughs> All right, so the reason I'm showing you this is I think this is kind of a like a very different kind of approach to like just using like i guess we're just kind of full tilt going into we're now going to measure concepts at the firm level and kind of really leveraging the granularity of this data to say something about transmissions of risk across countries but you can think of like that general principle of generating dyadic data from conference calls uh and kind of like think of other applications of that last thing i want to say is that this data here is going to be online uh very soon this firm country uh quarter level data and so if you're interested in this, it will be available. All right, so should we uh, take a 10 minute break? And then I actually, you probably, Jesse, you probably want me to finish up this module so I'll do five more minutes and then. Uh, just... So yeah, you're, you're, you're called. Do you wanna do five more minutes and then take the 10 minute break? Yeah, so very briefly. So uh, this method and other papers we've used also to, kind of look at the firm level pro propagation of specific shocks. There's in particular two papers, one about Brexit, where now that I've shown you all of this is pretty simple. So rather than looking at uncertainty associated with Germany, you just look at uncertainty associated just with Brexit. It's a one word thing. And you can do like a little event study and see, look at the stock returns around the Brexit referendum and look at firms that ex ante talked a lot about Brexit risk and you see that firms that talked a lot about Brexit risk lost a lot of market valuation when actually Brexit, the Brexit vote happened. Whereas firms that uh, uh, kind of said positive things about Brexit ex ante, which there's not many, very many of them, but there are some, 
uh, they gained relative market valuation. Um, okay. The other thing I like about this is you can go and like, actually, let me skip that. Um, we have another paper where we then kind of like use uh, this a similar method, like rather than looking for the word Brexit, we look for the word COVID, and we look at you know why is the firm talking about COVID? Are they talking about supply related impacts or demand related impacts? And this is actually kind of a central question in macro, or was was maybe still is a central question for policymakers when you have a shock like COVID, if the firm level impact of that shock is demand related, then maybe you want to really kind of crank up monetary policy and fiscal policy. If the shock is supply related and, they, and the firms are just saying, sorry, we can't produce anymore because of COVID, then any amount of monetary policy is not going to help you. So, and this is a way of getting to answers here by looking at what executives say about what specifically is the impact of the macro shock that you're talking about. All right, finally, um, oof, okay, so the last thing I wanted to highlight is there is kind of a like a uh, another literature um, that kind of looks at 10Ks. So, so far, everything I've said was about earnings conference calls. 10Ks are kind of more scripted once a year, so the disclosure that the firm makes. And what I want to highlight to you is there's really fun stuff in 10Ks. They're very boring, but there's sometimes you find like a section that's like super useful. Like, for example, a list of competitors of the firm or a description of what the firm does. What Holberg and Phillips do is they just take one of these sections and they use that to figure out which firm competes with which other firm. So they go and look at the description of what the firm does to earn its money. And they look at how similar is that to descriptions of what other firm, what a specific other firm says, how they make their money. And then you can kind of generate the uh, uh, um, um, standard distance measures based on that, how similar are the descriptions, and then draw a list of competitors for each firm. 